right, folks, we are back. This is Brian May is the host, and you are listening to the Amazing Outdoors podcast. I think we're at number 39 now. Today's episode, I sit down with the director of field operations for a group that is dedicated to getting kids outdoors, pass it on outdoor mentors, Brittany French. She is a very interesting gal, and I think you guys will enjoy today's show. Upland Outfitters. The Relentless Pants are still rocking it. I'll report back. I'll probably be in Kansas when this is out. So I'll have a full season. I think we'll be approaching somewhere between 50 and 60 days out in the field. I haven't exactly counted it up yet. They are still rocking it. Very impressed. Discount code Amazing is going to get you all 20% off. Make sure you support Upland Outfitters. I'm still rocking the Sport Dog Tech 2.0 this season, and I'm very impressed. So if you're looking for a GPS collar, something to locate your dog, check out the Sport Dog brand products. Today's episode, again, I sit down with Brittany French of Pass It On Outdoor Mentors. I think you all will really appreciate what they're doing and enjoy the show information for her and uh, how to be involved with this organization, possibly donate, give some funds, maybe have some ideas for them or want to start something in your own state or area, get a hold of Brittany. Enjoy the show. Awesome. We are live. I have a very interesting guest today and I'm, I'm super excited. I hope everybody enjoys the show as much as I'm going to enjoy it getting to know Brittany here, but I have Brittany French with Pass It On Outdoor Mentors. Um, It is a very interesting program and kind of near and dear to my heart because I'm I'm helping a gentleman here in uh, our local area try to get uh, a little bit more engaged with youth outreach. And uh, it's always been a passion of mine and a long-term goal to kind of give back to the next generation. And Um, My wife and I have always talked about different things that we could do over the years, so I'm interested to learn and and meet Brittany here as well. So Brittany, welcome to the Amazing Outdoors podcast, and uh, could you give the listeners a little background on yourself? Yeah, thanks for for having me, Brian. I appreciate it. This is fun. Um, We are, I guess I should start with me. You said me. Um, I am the director. Yeah, we'll we'll get into the organization in a little bit, but I want to get to know you a little bit better because... You know, all the listeners hunt and fish. And yeah. so we definitely want to understand, uh, you know, what's your uh, fancy in the outdoor world. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, look, let's get to know you a little bit. Yeah. Here. So I uh, was born and raised in uh, Southwest Kansas, uh, just around the Dodge City area, if anyone's familiar with that part of the world. And um, it's definitely like the beef capital of the world. So grew up doing lots of things, uh, horseback riding, uh, shooting, a little bit of hunting, um, played a lot of sports, uh, just really loved the outdoors. Um, and I really didn't get super invested into hunting until I started mentoring other kids in the, in the sport, which is kind of funny and kind of opposite of some people and how they get to that point of mentorship. Um, so I actually got involved with the Pass It On Outdoor Mentors program on a volunteer basis first, and that's been really fun. It's an interesting way into the outdoors. <laughs> it is. It really is. So I got to ask, though, before we get into a little bit further, so you, you, you grew up in a um, town that happens to be, I, I've never been, I, I've always been close. Oh, we got to change uh, that. I keep, I keep telling myself I need to make it out there because I, I don't know, my, my cousin and I and, and my brother, we all really loved Tombstone growing up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just the whole gateway to the west that dodge center was back in the turn of the century and and a little earlier than that has always allured me and and i've always been curious you know how i just want to go have dinner in dodge center sometime. yeah (laughs) you definitely need to it's uh like the wild wild west is what i always tell people um i played a college softball um here in wichita kansas and a lot of my teammates were from other states right and uh, i showed up to most of my you know 
team meetings and boots and jeans. And they kind of look at me like, where did this girl come from? <laughs> and I remember, you know, taking a couple of my teammates back home with me over some of our, our break periods. And I mean, just astonished that, you know, tumbleweeds blow out in the West and uh, what Boot Hill is and White Earp and all of that good stuff. And there's a lot of history in Dodge City and I, I'm really proud to be from there. I was kind of curious if, if you, I'm, I'm going to be down there and, and, the latter part of the month here. And, um, I was kind of curious if there, there is like a family, you know, or family uh, museum down there. By yeah. Chance. I haven't looked. <laughs> yeah. So it's called boot Hill and it's kind of like a replica of what Dodge city and used to look like and, uh, where kind of the history of white Earp and, um, they just redid the museum and it's phenomenal. They have an actual, uh, kind of like a, I don't know how you, how you even explain this, like a 3D virtual experience of standing in a room when a herd of buffalo come running through. It's pretty cool. Like the ground shakes, the room shakes. It's it's really neat. I was just uh, typing in the Google here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now I got it bookmarked. There you go. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a history. Well, I've always been intrigued by history because I, I'm the type of person that believes that, you know, History has lessons and Absolutely. If you're willing to look for them. Um, you don't have to kind of repeat the same mistakes over again. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. And so I've always been fascinated with history by that. And um, yeah, the whole wider story has always got me as a kid mm -hmm. growing up. And, and uh, I don't know, my uncle still watches uh, basically old Westerns all the time. Oh, so yeah. anytime he's around hunting camp, it's always, you know, <laughs> old Western time. I and, love that. I, I don't know. That's one thing I really do kind of love about Kansas as well and traveling down there is there's just a different feel to being in the in, in the big west kind of country and in yeah. the big prairie and being up here close to the north woods and kind of on that edge of farm country versus timber country. Mm -hmm. um, getting down there to really see more of the cattle style ranches and just, you know, a place where sections are regularly talked about when you talk about land instead of forties. <laughs> so, exactly. Exactly. It, 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 it's a much different perspective. And I, I love the big openness of that. And yeah. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to maybe, uh, you know, I go usually go for a couple days, uh, close to a week. Now I try to make it at least if I'm going to go down there and dogs usually need a break. So I'm going to have to maybe put that on the list here. I'm going to be down in, uh, uh, that close to that area, probably yeah. within an hour. Yeah, I, so. I would say if if I know where you're going, like we talked earlier, you're you're pretty close yeah. by. You know what I love about out west is it's just a slower pace of life. Um, Absolutely, no one's really in a big hurry to go anywhere, and it just you 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 slow down and really appreciate nature as it is, even if you're not trying to. Um, my family, we have a Longhorn cattle. Uh, and so it's, it's really enjoyable to take a walk out in the pasture and just, you almost feel like you take a moment and step back in time <laughs> and exactly. you can't duplicate that unless you just go do it. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I, I hit a lot of the Weehaw property and, you know, some of them are, are pretty big and they have, you know, I, one of my strategies down there when I come down is what are people overlooking or what are people going, oh, that's too big. And they're not willing to walk, you know, the quarter mile in to the piece of property to get back to where it's good. Mm -hmm. And so I just find so much back in, once you get away from the road, there's, oh, my, my buddy collects license plates. That's right? awesome. <laughs> Every state he goes to, he collects an old license. He always, he's been bugging me for like three days when we were down there. Like, we got to stop at the antique store. Got to get a license plate. <laughs> and we were on this very large couple section track of property and, um, kind of went down into the creek bottom and you know, there was a little coolie to get down there and I'll be damned, but there's six, seven cars piled up. In oh, there. How funny. I'm, I'm like, I didn't want to go anywhere near it. Cause I, you know, I got two, two short hairs and you know, they're, they're not, uh, completely fur broke. <laughs> so I didn't want to get them all tangled up with anything down there with all yeah. the metal. And, uh, but he, he started digging around and, uh, in five minutes, he found his license plate and he found a Cal old California one too. That's so, fantastic. But, you know, it's those things that I, I, I don't know, I, you have, you feel like you almost have to take the time out there to do and um, just 
kind of slot, whatever it is, take mm-hmm. a few pictures, slow down. Um, you, you referenced the different pace of life and, and I kind of find it very similar to Island, uh, Island time, Yeah, you know? it, it, which, which is attractive to me when, when I'm hunting, you know, my, when I started going down there, my buddy and I used to try to cram it all into three days and I just kind of rejected that now. It's like, yeah. I, I just can't, I, I need the downtime with my dogs because there's just cool things to go see. And, you know, I, I like being out in the vast openness mm-hmm. and even if it's in the mountains or up in the big timber, um, you know, just not being away or not being able to see the next house. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> I just kind of like that feeling, you know, mm-hmm. it's, Maybe it's my reclusiveness or whatnot, but <laughs> hey, it's a it's, it's a very part of uh, feeling right there. That's it's very normal, I would say. <laughs> it, it it's a good place to clear your head. Yes. So, what? Uh, so, so you got involved in the outdoors in um, through this this pass it on mentor program. Um, what uh, what have you kind of gotten into since then? I, I obviously you're the director of field operations. So you're out doing fun stuff all the yeah. time, but have, have you taken up anything on your own time? Yeah. You know, growing up, we didn't do, I didn't hunt a, a whole lot. You know, it wasn't until I was a teenager when I finally said, Hey, I would like to go do this. Um, and I had some uncles and a, a grandparent who took me in, and it was so much fun, but I had such limited experience. Um, you know, getting involved with outdoor mentors has just opened up so many opportunities for me personally, professionally, and as a mentor. Um, so with that, I've been able to really kind of expand on what I hunt as well. Um, you know, got into deer hunting because of this program. I never shot a deer until I started with this program, mostly because a lot of my family aren't deer hunters, um, and access is a problem and, uh, it's just lots of variables, right? So I've definitely, um, gotten more into deer hunting and I love it. Um, and I, I enjoy water or upland hunting like everybody else on that probably listens to your podcast pretty thoroughly. I, I really enjoy it. I could do that all day, every day and not be disappointed about it. So uh, I'm going to throw off a curveball at you. Yeah. It's just a, just a little concept since you, you're, you're in the conservation scene as well. Yes. Um, do you prefer Bob White over pheasant? when you're hunting out in Kansas mm. or do you like the prairie chickens? I mean, what, what, what's your, what's your favorite bird down there? You know, I've never actually got into any prairie chickens yet. That's on my to-do list still. Um, it's kind of funny saying that too, since I live here and it's so accessible, but just haven't, haven't gone into it yet. Um, well, um I've only shot two in my lifetime. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not something that honestly, I, I talk to a lot of people down there and, and, not everybody does it. It's it's yeah. not for the faint of heart. And yeah, it's hard. You, it's hard hunting. Especially as the the year progresses, um, when really all the upland hunting opens, I, it gets significantly harder. I, yes. I think if you were to go when prairie chicken opens, which I haven't done yet personally, um, you know, they, they, they tend to cooperate a little bit better, I hear. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It, it's on my list of, of things to do in September, uh, this this. 2022 here perfect perfect well when you make your way down here you let me know we'll go together <laughs> yeah exactly yeah no i i would definitely be uh be open to that i i kind of bounce around a little bit all over the state of kansas now and um i've got some i think mutual friends and um yeah I, there there could be an opportunity to drag some kids along as there well you go. I think. that's yeah, awesome I'd, I'd love i'd love to get involved in that so um so you never answered my question. Yeah. Bob White or, or <laughs> yeah, pheasant. Yeah. I, I threw prairie chickens out there, you know, in, in the spotlight. Uh, yeah. Uh, changed a little bit of the conversation. But um, are you are are you a big, do you like the pheasant hunting or do you, do you, do you prefer seeing, you know, the covey rise? Man, that's a hard question because I love both. Um, but I think, and the reason I'm I asking is I, I kind pheasant. of have a little bit. Of, okay. Yeah. But go ahead. Sorry. Fair enough. No, no, no problem. I, I, I have a, a really big kind of soft spot for the native game birds. Ah. Um, they're, 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 they're the underdog. They're the ultimate underdog. It really, in the yeah. Scene. <laughs> um, and, and, and I mean that in a, in a sense that, you know, pheasants aren't native and they really are a great bird to get people into, to bird hunting 
Um, they're a lot easier to, to shoot. They, they do not fly as fast as a covey of quail. Mm -hmm. Um, and they tend to provide a significant amount more meat. Um, so there's a, that take home benefit you kind of feel yeah. a little bit, a little bit more than, um, if you were to, uh, you know, only get one quail for the day. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, you might be a little hungry. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it, so, so there's that aspect that I won't deny, you know, pheasant hunting, if you're, especially if you're new, it's, it's great. But my, my big gruff is that, you know, I spent like states up here in Wisconsin and Minnesota, it, there's a pheasant stamp you have to, to buy in order to, mm. you know, upland hunt or pheasant hunt. We don't have anything really else other than, you know, some pockets of sharp tail grouse. And then you got the rough grouse, which you don't need a, a stamp for. Um, and that stamp money goes to, you know, habitat or to, to releasing more pheasants, but it really doesn't disseminate further than that. And I, you know, like, well, let's, let's, we're, we're leaving our native game birds behind here. And, yeah. Um, they, they tend to not get the, the resources and, you know, you got organizations like pheasants forever and stuff. And they're a lot of the habitat projects that are done are, well, you know, we make it for pheasants or make it for deer, you know, we'll, we'll, the other birds will benefit too. And yep. it's, it's, um, it, unfortunately it's led to a lot of decline in native game birds across the country, I think is kind of the root cause and, um, nothing against pheasants forever. I, I don't want to say not join or don't want to see that they're, they're doing great things for everything. It's just, uh, I think we need to recenter the focus a little bit and, um, I, I'm not going to be, the, I will never not pull the trigger on a rooster that's within my sight. Yeah. But, uh, at the same time, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of coming around to toying with, you know, it's like duck hunting, you got to buy a federal duck stamp. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those got dollars go right back into habitat. And, Absolutely. And, and you look at the, the, the waterfall increase and then you lay over the Bob white quail decline on the graph and you can, you can pretty much tell a story. Yeah. And, 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 and that's a, it's just a soft spot for me. So not having quail up here in the numbers, um, our huntable numbers. Um, I really, 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 that's what I go to Kansas for. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked it and, and no, no big deal. It's, it's an, it's an opinion and, and <laughs> take it or leave it. <laughs> but, uh, I, I definitely, think that the people who are going to Kansas this year to hunt pheasants definitely noticed a little bit of a decline in the numbers. Yeah. Yes, sir. The, the numbers are definitely lower um, than they have been. There's still plenty of them. Yeah, there's plenty, um, but it's it's different. And I think uh, painfully, Kansans especially are, are aware of that. Um, and, you know, we're always talking about ways on the commissioners to talk about how, how can we change that? What can we do? How can we be better? And that's, you know, going back to what you said about the decline in quail, it's, you know, we could always do better. We just got to all get on the same page on that and figure out how to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a, I, I'm going to use this reference and I don't know if it's drastic enough, but it's like pushing water uphill. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a big challenge ahead of us. Um, and it, it's a multifaceted. Yes. There, nobody, no singular organization or entity really owns any of the majority of the share of the problem or the solution. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's really a fractional issue that, like you said, everybody just kind of needs to get on the same page. And I think you just have to shift your focus. And, and I think, you know, if you, if you were to manage for quail, pheasants are going to absolutely benefit from that. Yep. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's quail are a, more of an indicator species, I think, as well than pheasants will ever be. And and I, if we're going to draw policy, I think we need to be looking at indicator species versus, you know, a a, a bird that we released on the landscape. Mm. So that, that's that's my gripe about it. But and, and and the funding all goes to the pheasant. They get a lot of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if that much money went to Bob White Quail, I just kind of wonder what would happen. Yeah, it does make you dream about that, huh? <laughs> It does. And that, that's kind of the whole point is to, to, you know, put that thought out there. I've, uh, ever since I really kind of got involved in, in conservation and over the last couple of years, I've really noticed that and being that I don't have quail up here that I can hunt. Like I, I, I've always, it's always been a little bit of a sore spot when 
I see all the funding or all the policy or all, you know, Wisconsin released 70,000 or yeah, 70,000 pheasants last year. Gone. Isn't that nuts? Oh, we could probably raise 200,000 quail and release them. And yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, not that I would have done anything, but I don't know that, you know, 70,000 pheasants really does anything either. So um, it, it, it's, it, it's opportunity again for people who aren't necessarily as much of a nut as I am. And I, I oftentimes have to humble myself with that a little bit and, mm-hmm. and remind myself that, you know, the first time I ever got introduced to a pheasant was released on a game farm. So, mm-hmm. um, and boy, has my opinion changed. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I haven't been back to a game farm in a long time. Um, but you know, people that don't have the opportunities or want to create as many opportunities, um, look at, look at a game farm as, as an opportunity to get out. And I hold, I don't hold that against anybody. Yeah. Um, we, I'm, there's I'm just a, a lot little bit of, of a dog opinions. purist, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of opinions <laughs> about that. We, um, we've always not steered away from preserves, um, and game farms, but for whatever reason, you know, because of politics and just opinions of others who are not in favor of those, um, hunts, we didn't do it, but this past couple of years, we've been engaging with a lot of preserves and boy, howdy, it's a great way to teach a kid how to pheasant hunt. Um, it obviously is. It, it is, is a very in- controlled environment and. Oh, and that's the part that I think yeah. lends itself really good to introduction Yeah, is it is a controlled environment. Yes. Yes. Um, I can, you know, I'm a, I'm a guide and I know what it's like to have to go through a day where you don't have the cooperation of mother nature mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh you know it's the hospitality side of me that uh you know i have to entertain the guests because the fish aren't doing it or, right exactly uh, and, and and when you throw bird hunting on that on, on wild birds um with newbies that uh you know you got running birds and all the other things that come along with chasing pressured wild birds uh, it, it becomes really difficult to set up a scenario where somebody can really get excited about it. Mm-hmm. You know, you can do that on a preserve pretty easily and, and, and really have an impactful outcome for somebody new and then give them the tools to go out and yeah. hopefully chase wild birds. Yeah. It's like the, the safety, um, component of upland hunting, the, you know, the behavior of pheasants, um, Throw in dogs in the mix, you know, what are flushing dogs? What are pointing dogs? How do you avoid injuring any dogs? How do you avoid, um, you know, injuring your partners down the line? I mean, there's so many details that go into upland hunting. And I, I love going on those preserve hunts with those kids because in the moment, that is like wild hunting to them. I mean, that is so new. <laughs> they, yeah, they don't know any better. They don't. And, and, <laughs> and then you get, to, you get the opportunity, like, you know, I, <laughs> preserve birds will run. I, don't yep. get me wrong. I, I've, I've hunted plenty of them that there's always leftover birds and those leftover birds get educated very quickly. Um, and it, it, it but <laughs> you still have the ability to go, you know, stash one in the bushes for the young guy. And he, you know, he might not never know that somebody was there 20 minutes earlier and put a bird there and you connect what would take a lot of boot tread mm-hmm. and a lot of, you know, physical fortitude that I, you know, some of these kids just don't have Yep. and that it it takes time to build that. So, um, I know I will, I've been frustrated more than, more than, you know, most guys, I didn't get to do what I wanted to do on a trip. And had I, you know, gone to a preserve, I would have filled the cooler full of birds. But again, it's, it's, what do you want out of it? And as a mature person that's been doing this for a long time, you know, I find the enjoyment in making sure my dogs are getting the opportunity to learn something. And that's where, you know, I, I, I personally grew um, weary of, of, of preserves or game farms because I, I had two dogs I wanted to progress and I couldn't do that in that scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, if you have flushing dogs and got good labs, I mean, you're not going to hurt those dogs but i've got a couple pointing dogs and 
I wanted some distance out of them. And it's just a really tough thing to, you got too many cents <laughs> on yeah. a preserve, too yeah, many, too sure. many, too many people cents, uh, especially around here. You know, you get some pretty big preserves down by you guys that are mm-hmm. way more like natural hunting. Anything would be around here. I mean, yeah. the preserve that I, I, I started on, the guy went through with the ATV and put birds in the field before we started. And we were hunting a 35 acre field. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, it's nothing like pretty much what, what I'm sure there's some preserves like that down there. Yeah. But, but for most the most of them part, I've seen are in the, you know, thousands of acres, which really makes a huge difference when, when you're talking about, uh, what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm, absolutely. For, for the kids, I don't know that it makes much difference, but, um, again, it's, it's, it's about creating that foundation and inspiring them to kind of dig deeper and want more out of it and go again. And eventually, well, maybe they'll, they'll, uh, get somewhere close to as nutty as I am about yeah. it, wanting to teach it and pass it on to other people and, and guide people and, you know, leave the shotgun or the fishing pole myself and in the truck and, and really try to pass it on. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's dive into, Oh, well, anything else you want to share? You know, yeah. um, what, uh, what is it? Actually, I do have one more question for you. Um, for you, what is the, what's the appeal and, and why have, why has this struck such a chord in your life to, to want to, be the director of field operations mm. for an organization like this, you know, yeah. uh, obviously there's some gratification in it, but really, uh, have, have, have you found something that you feel, uh, maybe you didn't know when you walked into the position? Yeah. You know, I would, I'll tell a quick story from when I first started mentoring. So before I was even hired, right. Um, again, grew up in Western Kansas, um, pretty educated in the outdoors compared to a lot of, um, inner city kids. And my first hunt with the program was in Harveyville, Kansas, and it was a turkey hunt. So it was April. I think it was the youth season, April, early April. And we load up some kids and we're driving through the Flint Hills and the Flint Hills are just beautiful. There's known to be lots of cattle, horses, uh, wildlife, and especially antelope, which is really cool. So we're driving through the Flint Hills and this little boy um, that's going with us is in my back seat, and he goes, oh my gosh, Britt, what is that? What is that? And I look, and I'm looking, and I just see cows. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. It's like, where? Like, what are you pointing at? And so he was so adamant about me figuring this out. I just went ahead and pulled over and said, well, tell me what you're looking at. And he, and he pointed at this big black cow. And he didn't understand that cows look differently. He didn't realize that not all cows were the traditional black and white dairy cows. <laughs> so not even getting to the hunt yet in my head, and no pun intended, I'm thinking, holy cow, this program is so important. We have kids who have never seen and don't know different livestock. You know, they've never seen dirt roads. They've never heard tree branches rub together and listen to the woods come alive when the sun's going up. Um, and, 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 you know, that right there um, made me so passionate about being involved with this organization that when it came time to accept a job offer, I was like, yes, not <laughs> heck yes. Like I'm on board because this mission, it needs to be across the entire U.S. I kind of got goosebumps when you're telling that story Aww. and, and well, it, 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 it should, you know, strike people. Yeah. Um, I do this for a living. I, I'm on a dirt road or a mm-hmm. gravel road all the time. I'm, I spend, try to spend more time in the woods or in the field than in my house. Um, I love it. And yeah. to, you know, it, I kind of take it for granted. Yep. And it's that taking for granted part that really people need to look in the mirror and go, you know, there's somebody else out here that you could introduce this to. Yeah. And they're um, super deserving it, of that too. I think we're and so. And there's a lot of people yeah. who need, need it and don't understand they need it. And all it takes is extending a hand. Absolutely. So I, I, I it's, it's really inspiring. I just even <laughs> haven't, haven't made it to the hunt. And I mean, just yeah. those little things that are already making an impact on somebody Yeah, that you and I take for granted every day. 
Yeah. And, you know, yeah. so imagine, you know, being a female, so kind of like of a minority of the sport of hunting anyway, um, taking kids who are a minority of an inner city out, um, it, you quickly realize the disconnect that we have um, and the importance of passing that on to kids and even adults who don't look like you um, because they're just as deserving as you are to be in the outdoors but they might need a little extra coaching, a little extra help because they don't have that traditional um, upbringing in the hunting world or that traditional hunting heritage, as we call it. Absolutely. I, it's kind of been a personal mission of, of myself um, and my wife have talked about this for years and, you know, we're not there yet. Um, but the long-term goal is to, you know, have a place for, at risk kids, kids from broken homes, um, but a, just a camp. Yeah. Can bring them out, you know, a couple weeks a year, teach them how to hunt, get them into that, you know, and, and do it for free and offer it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's always been, we've talked about it since the day we met, you know, basically my wife's kind of the caregiver and I'm kind of the outdoor nut and kind of country boy. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, like I said, I, I just, I, I've always wanted to, shift the paradigm and, mm -hmm. and make that impact because it's been so impactful to my life. And I just, I know the connection both between wanting to conserve this for the next generation and where that's got to come from, but also just making the impact on somebody's life and giving them something and not even giving it, just introducing them to something that they've never had the opportunity to be introduced to. Exactly. It's really, really super impactful because I've, I've seen it with different people fishing, hunting, um, just bird watching, mm -hmm. you know, um, one of the, the gentlemen that, that I've had on the podcast here, he's a, a gentleman from down South came up here, started our quail forever chapter. And, um, he, he just loved quail and he, he wants to, you know, he, he'd love to get just people who are in nursing homes out outdoors. Mm -hmm. This guy just you know, connect them with somebody who can get them a ride, take them out somewhere, and set sit on a bench out. Yeah, and, you know it, it. Those types of things, I think, again, people overlook and they don't realize how much a little task like that can make an impact in somebody's life, and especially today with um, basically more or less being shut in mm -hmm. in in more scenarios than than not um uh, being isolated that you know really you're not that isolated if you can go outdoors and be connected with nature yeah. there's a lot of different things other than people to connect with outside so yeah, uh, people can make such a huge impact <laughs> yes technology yes. <laughs> yes i i i like calling it you know going back to the old analog days <laughs> But really, though, <laughs> it it is, it, and that's why I partly I love Kansas because my stuff most for the most part I stay in places that don't have Wi Fi, and well, the one town I can't even get really cell signal in the house, which is perfect. That's great. <laughs> it's just total shutdown, and and I really don't unless the wife calls, I or you're going to be meeting up with me to hunt that day. I, I'm hunting. I I don't answer. I it's it's. Uh, it's just my time, my time and whoever I'm with and the dogs. Yeah. So that's important to keep that. Well, it is, it is. I think today, again, because of all the scenarios, it's, it's very difficult to find it. So you have to, you have to, I don't know. I, I go all in when I go. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the program here. Yeah. How, how, how did, how did you guys get your start and what is really the root of the mission that you guys are doing some things that I know a lot of other conservation tr groups are, are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you guys are having an immense amount of success and more than maybe some other groups. So I, I would love to kind of hear how you got your start and what you guys are doing and hear about uh, kind of what you guys did this year too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Pass It On Outdoor Mentors is a, a 501c3 nonprofit 
Um, and historically, uh, we got started back in 2002. So we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this July. We're really excited about that. And for those of you who know anything about nonprofits, it's it's hard to keep them going. It's hard to keep them funded. It's hard to keep the mission uh, exciting and um, moving forward. So that itself is such a huge accomplishment for us. And we have so many people to thank for that. But um, back in 2002, we got started serving kids in organizations like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and Youth Horizons, for example. So those are um, definitely underserved, marginalized, inner city kids. And the point was, how can we capitalize on, at the time, was the first Kansas Youth Upland season. And it was in 99, um, 1999. And uh, a couple folks came to the table, and our current um, president and CEO, Mike Christensen, kind of got involved casually and said, yeah, I'll take some kids out hunting. Why not? Um, Fast forward a couple more years to 02, and, you know, the the plan was kind of established of this was a really good success over the past few years. We need to make this a permanent program to get these kids out and support our mentors and, and being matched to those little brothers, little sisters in the organizations. You know, you can, you can only paint so many pottery things and go to so many cooking classes and movies. Why not engage with these kids in the outdoors and do something they have never done? So, uh, at that point, uh, Mike was tasked to, uh, start this program and, <laughs> Uh, the the former CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters here in Kansas at the time said, "Okay, you go go raise your salary and you can get started." <laughs> and uh, that's exactly kind of what happened um, from the get go. And and that's been our mission to get kids outdoors, hunting and fishing in any capacity we can. Um, it was in 2018 is when Mike started noticing the clay target leagues um, have been mushrooming in size across the U.S., especially where you are at right now, Brian. Um, here in Kansas, to speak, we have close to 2,000 kids shooting trap on a high school level, which is really neat because this is now a varsity lettering sport. Um, boys and girls can shoot on the same team. It's just really unique, and it's it's an outdoor activity, obviously. So Mike kind of thought to himself, how do we bridge the gap between these kids shooting targets and get them hunting? And that's kind of where I came into the picture. Um, We kind of brainstormed and thought, how can we create a program while still serving our big brothers, big sisters, kids, right? How can we create a program to supplement us getting even more kids outside? And so that's where we came up with our, you know, our shooting sports outreach program where we we plan new and continued hunting opportunities for these kids who are shooting trap um, across Kansas and now in Iowa as well. Well, I think, uh, you know, there's going to be some conversations that that happen after the podcast um, for sure, because there's no reason that. If they're in Iowa and you started in Kansas, we just can't keep moving it north here. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I I did recently make some connections with uh, folks in the shooting sports realm here. Um, I'm just starting to scratch the surface, honestly, with you, Brittany. I I I was of the era in high school where um, we could still have shotguns in the back window of our sure. truck <laughs> and we went hunting before and after school. Yeah, that was very normal. Uh yes, it was very normal. And I, I grew up in a fairly, you know, sizable town. I not not uh not a huge city, but I mean there was fifty thousand people in our town. Um so it was a good decent size middle America city. Yeah. Um but uh it wasn't very long after that I might have even been my senior year that the rules changed mm. and, and, you know, they changed for a bunch of different reasons, but you know, school shootings happened and, and, yeah. and, and the dynamic had, had changed. Um, less kids were hunting. Right. Uh, it, right. It, I mean, that, that was one of the biggest reasons is I, I went to a small Catholic high school and I, there was significantly less kids in our class that, that, uh, than the public school, but there was only a handful of us who really hunted and wanted to hunt hard. A lot of people I know that from high school actually got into hunting after high yeah. school. So the, that early introduction, um, even back when I was in, in school was starting to kind of fade because people weren't, it, it just wasn't part of the, the heritage. Everybody's grandpa hunted, mm-hmm. but not everybody hunted. 
Yeah, um, and we see that. Fair amount of us did. Yeah. But I, I, even, even now, I, I know that's declined even worse. Yeah, we see that, you know, across the, the board, right, is baby boomers are kind of in this age range of kind of retiring from hunting for health reasons or, you know, mobility reasons or just, you know, they're not hunting as much, right, because of age. And we're going to start seeing this gap of generational um, passing down the, the heritage of hunting and there's gaps, <laughs> big gaps. And part of that is, you know, if, if my great grandpa hunted, great. And he passed it down to my grandpa even better. But then when my grandpa tried to train my dad and I'm just shooting from the hip here, this isn't real life. And my dad said, hey, I don't have time. I've got kids. I've got a career. We're moving across the state or new to a new state. They're not going to pick up the sport of hunting. So now that parent has kids who also don't hunt. <laughs> and what, you know, what happens after that? You know, it's just a repeat cycle of kids not getting outdoors. And well, and then, you know, you heard me going down the rabbit hole of, you know, peasants get all the funding. Well, you know, the money dries up too. Yeah. It does. Not only, you know, is, is nobody going outside, uh, outdoors and loving these sp- spaces, the money dries up and then there's there's a huge political disconnect that happens as yeah. well. So the, ultimately, everybody loses. Yep. It, 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 we have to, to bridge that gap. Otherwise, the perpetual nature of things uh, don't, don't lend themselves down to a very good rabbit hole. Yeah, it gets kind of scary thinking about a world full of people who don't know how to provide for themselves and that's not just hunting and fishing that's like gardening and you know being a more primitive individual to where if we have a market shortage we're going to be okay but that 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 personal sustainability portion is definitely um it's a difficult one because life is very easy to go to the grocery store Mm -hmm. um it costs a lot of money to go actually produce your own food. Yep. Especially if you don't have space, you don't have the equipment. I mean, you know, a shotgun or a rifle today, you know, you can look at a couple hundred dollar minimum expenditure Mm -hmm. and then you have to learn how to use it. Um, have to be able to procure the ammo. Yep, absolutely. (laughs) Um, you know, so there, there's already market shortages happening in a sense. And I think that that is one of the kind of primitive reasons we're seeing a lot of people who hadn't been interested in the outdoors get into it um, is because they, they feel the urge to, to learn these things. Um, but I also think at a young age, there's, there's something to be said for drawing a real distinction um, kind of on the circle of life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you take somebody out, and I found this with bird hunting. Um, you know, deer hunting's tough. I, I, over the years, become a little soft myself when, when I, I take an animal because I got a couple that rely on me. And man, those deer look a lot like my dogs at some <laughs> some certain moments, you know. And 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 you are taking a life, and um, it's sometimes when you know we have to witness the whole thing go down. Um, it, it's a difficult thing to process. Um, you know, bow hunting, I've had had a few deer over the years that didn't make it very far. And, you know, you kind of watch them die. And um, I don't know if, if that doesn't tug at you a little bit somewhere. Maybe you don't show it, but at least, you you know, you show it in your appreciation for the animal. There's something wrong, you know. And so when you're trying to introduce kids at, at a young age who are very impressionable by stuffed animals and whatever, um, it... it, it It becomes, you got to get past that. So that's, Mm. I guess, where I was going. The upland hunting really, I think, lends itself well to that introduction. Um, Have you ever had an issue with with kids where you had them out in the deer stand and they got too attached to the deer and didn't want to shoot them? Um, Personally, no. I I have had some mentors report back to me that um, that's happened. Whether it was they just couldn't get comfortable enough to shoot or that they just all of a sudden decided, like, I'm not quite ready to take the life of this animal in front of me. Maybe a few times. Um, we definitely try to talk to our kids about that before the hunts we, we put on, too, is that this is not just, well, you you know, this is a sport, right? Yes. Is it going to provide you food? Yes. 
but ultimately you're I mean you're taking the life of something um the sacrifice of that animal is is to be respected and you have to really understand the weight of that and our kids do a really good job at processing that with us that's really awesome yeah because uh well, all of a sudden I get a little static bump here <laughs> um I, like I said, I, I'm, I've been deer hunting for years and I still struggle with that at some point. Um, so I gotta, I have to imagine that somebody who isn't emotionally ready to do that can struggle with it. And that, again, I, I point to the upland hunting scenario because, you know, deer hunting, you kind of sit there and wait, and mm -hmm. there's the, all the anticipation that builds up and then the animal comes out and, um, so you, you kind of become a little bit more intimate with the scenario versus in upland hunting, you know, be, all of a sudden the bird pops up and you shoot. Yeah. So the, there isn't that amount of time to even become sure. intimate with the animal. Um, birds are a lot less. Um, they don't look like your typical family pet unless yeah. you grew up with a bunch of parakeets, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so again, I think it's a little easier for, and then also, you know, the bird itself, it, it processes much easier than, than a, than a, than a deer. Uh, there's a lot less blood. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, true. Uh, you know, the, I, I, I remember the first time I took my stepson out and, um, he, uh, he, he, he fooled me. I got upset with him because he wasn't, he was supposed to be. I dropped him off. You sit up against the tree here because he didn't want to sit in the tree stand and made a little blind for him. And I'm like, I'll be back in two hours. His ma shoots a deer, hour and a half in. I, all right, I got to go. Why? He's not there. And he's back in the car and he, I get there. I kind of read him a riot act and he's smiling at me. And I hear, I damn near stepped on the deer that he had shot. Um, must have walked right over it. Never saw it. Never heard him shoot. I was, wow. I was really kind of surprised. We had some hill in there that definitely could have carried the shot in a different direction, and it would have sounded a lot further away from me. But, anyways, the long and short of it is, I had to gut the deer because he got in there and it was a lot. Blood and <laughs> he turned green, and I was afraid he was going to spoil the meat. So. <laughs> I said, get out of there. Let me, let me show you how it's done. And then you can do the next one. Yeah. We were, we were concerned a little while that his, uh, desire to become a physician was, was maybe not the best career choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he couldn't uh, handle gutting out a That's deer. You know, I, I don't know how you're going to sew somebody back up. That's really funny. Yeah. And I think but, that's a, a, a learning curve for kids too. I think we quickly expect these kids to go on one hunt and just like love it immediately or have this immense passion for it. And that they're like all in, but what we found is it really does take us planning hunting opportunities of different species and these kids getting out on them multiple times for them to really understand um, the sport and just like really appreciate it and know what they want to do. Cause like you've mentioned, you know, deer hunting is great for some people. Other people can't stand it. You know, they don't want to do it, but they'll go waterfowl hunt until they're blue in the face. And, and that's a big part of um, our organization is. Well, and people change. Yeah. I, honestly, like yeah. I used to love deer hunting and I, I, I don't know the pursuit of game to me yep. versus sitting and waiting for it to come has become a much bigger draw in life. And I oftentimes, well, the, the collision of seasons happens. And yeah, that's <laughs> My true. dogs are ready to go. And then I'm sitting in the tree stand the whole time going, I should be bird hunting. Yep. <laughs> and then I go out bird hunting and it's like, damn, this is a perfect day to be sitting in the tree stand. But you know, so it, it, it it's a personal paradigm. But at the same token, um, I've never in my life have I shot at a legitimate deer that I snuck up on on the on the ground. Um, and this season, I got an arrow off at a fairly decent, you know, respectable 150 inch whitetail. Mm. That uh, that was a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, that's and great. Now you know Congrats. it shifts the paradigm again, and and so that that. That whole point is is kind of, I guess, to icing on the cake with your experience with these kids is that it it takes a little bit of different 
flavors and a little bit of different scenarios to to actually get a spark going Mm -hmm. and you have to experience things and and you can go out and go duck hunting one day and have a mediocre day Uh, you can't control those things right so um now the kid may not like it because it's a mediocre day well how do you know that you know and 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 he might not know that Mm mm-hmm so getting him or her, getting him back out in another scenario and um, trying to have success might only bring that perspective to the child mm-hmm. or the adult. Mm-hmm. I mean, anybody. It happened to me. So uh, it happens to me often. <laughs> I keep finding new things I like in the outdoors all the time. And that's good. <laughs> that it is. That means you're spending enough time outdoors. <laughs> Well, and, and I rarely will you catch me hunting the same scenario, except when it comes to a tree stand the same way twice. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm of the firm belief that, um, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is crazy. It's like the <laughs> definition of insanity, right? <laughs> it, it, yeah. Well, it is. <laughs> So where have so you founded kind of with the big brothers, big sisters, and a couple of these other inner cities uh programs. What uh what was the crux and how did you kind of get past some of uh you know, inner city people aren't typically connected to hunting, I think which leads to a perception that, you know. Not that hunters are bad, but um, not every home has a gun. Mm-hmm. So you have the potential to interact with 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 uh, people who are uneducated about guns, yeah, and very weary. Maybe, um, maybe not completely anti gun, but people who you you have to do that introduction to as well. Um, how how did Obviously, you got your start and recently added the trap stuff. Yeah. So you found success in in that scenario. What what really led to that success? And did you guys teach hunters safety at a like class level in your local big brothers and big sisters group? Or yeah, how did how did that work? I I I'm, were there big brothers that were actually hunters and wanted to take kids out hunting? I, I'm kind of curious because yeah. it's a little bit against the grain. It is. It's and, definitely and I is. think that hearing that story, there's a lot of people who are wondering how they can make that impact in life and be against the grain. They just don't know how to get started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So obviously most of these kids who are part of Big Brothers Big Sisters are, you know, like I mentioned earlier, typically underserved and um, inner city kids. And not all of them are. Um, you know, I would, I would say broken homes and things like that. There, there's kind of a spectrum of kids needs there. Right. But I would argue and say that most of them probably don't have any, um, proper gun training within their homes if they have a gun in their home. <laughs> and if they've been around guns, it's probably been in a fairly negative experience. Right. And so a big, part of our mission is a, all of our kids have to be hunter ed certified. That is a non-negotiable, um, thing for us. You know, we think it's important that they understand conservation, how to get out of a situation if they're in in trouble, if they're hurt, um, and more importantly, gun safety, right. (laughs) And that at the end of a barrel is death. And I always, I always say that to the kids I mentor because it's, it's no joke. (laughs) And so, with a lot I'm of, of the, you're, you're kind of speaking a little bit to the choir in, yeah. in that retrospect, because I truly believe that it should be taught in school. Yes. Yes. As long as if kids are educated about what to do in a scenario with a gun, then we shouldn't have death yep. with children that encounter guns that they're, that aren't their parents or aren't protected or whatever the scenario, if they understand what uh, and 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 to even add a little bit more to that, we have, and it was kind of back to my circle of life comment I made earlier too. In, in today's culture with video games, you fail, you get to do it over. Yeah, uh, that that mentality, and then the introduction to a lot of different, you know, 
weapons and things with a lot of these these video games i think ultimately leaves a really deadly scenario if people aren't mm -hmm. educated on 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 firearms yeah so we're almost I, I, like that's where that's where i'm them. well and yeah exactly yeah. Exactly. So you and might it's a really have bad paradigm. This, but here's what you should have done in that situation. Or you might have witnessed this, but here's what that person should have done. It's kind of, in a, a strange way, exciting when we serve some of these kids who are so green to firearms and hunting because it's kind of a challenge, right? You get to start them from the very beginning. And how powerful can, you, can that be to change that kid's future? Um, in the world by teaching them, you know, if someone brings a gun to a situation, you have the option to leave and that's okay. Or if you're in a hunting situation and you're hunting with people you don't know, or someone might be new and you don't like the way someone's handling their gun, it's okay to leave. Um, it's, it's, it's cool to empower these kids through that hunter education process. And I would venture to say most of our mentors at, um, are matched through the Big Brothers Big Sisters program are pretty uh, versatile in the outdoor world. I would say most of them are hunting already, so it's kind of cool to have them get like this built-in hunting buddy um, through that match. That's a, I, I don't know, maybe not everybody's like me, but I I, I always like new hunting buddies. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, it provides me another opportunity to get out. I find, especially at my age, I kind of unique. Um, my wife's a couple years older than me, but we're both pretty young parents. Um, my, my two stepkids, um, I, they're adults now and I'm not quite 40. So my friends are all having families and busy with their jobs. So I, I oftentimes need new hunting buddies in order to go hunting nearly as much as I'd like. Yeah. <laughs> And fishing to that degree sometimes. It's kind of another reason why I became a guide. <laughs> absolutely. It's a great way to get out. <laughs> Good excuse it, to get out. It, it absolutely is. Um, and you guys are doing some guiding to a, to a certain degree. And I, I think we align in that there's a, there's a teaching element to this mm -hmm. that, uh, that's not for everybody. I, I know. People in my household, um, not necessarily my help, my family would never be able to put themselves last in line and, and, and teach somebody and get enjoyment out of them catching their first fish or, yeah. you know, shooting their first animal. Um, it, it, it's, a, and, and I think it is a little bit of an inherent nature with traditional outdoorsmen. Um, I know even a lot today, you, you ask a some, some characters, you know, where'd you catch that fish? Yeah, in the lake, <laughs> you know? So it's not always, um, you know, hunters are kind of secretive of their spots and um, fishermen are kind of um, secretive of, of what they do and how they do it and the, where they go fishing. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, pressure and resources and, and you know, people thinking that either they uh, own the place or mm. there's too many people or they don't know how to deal with a scenario where there's multiple people on a piece of property or whatever it may be. Um, but today there's, there's still that mentality, I think in the outdoor space with, with your average hunter, average fisherman, um, they, they don't always reach across the aisle. Yeah. Extend the hand. They are relatively secret. And I think it's what you guys are doing is, is kind of against the grain in opening up those opportunities for kids. And, and it really needs to happen. And I, I really commend you guys for doing that. So no, oh, thank you. It takes cool. a village. We're definitely not, <laughs> we're definitely not doing this alone. You know, you mentioned, um, well, conservation well, that's kind of where groups. it was. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask yeah. you. So who, who are you guys also partnering with? Yeah. Um, you're re going after the, the trap kids and, and the inner city kids, but you got to have somewhere to take them. Yep. Uh, guns aren't cheap. You know, hunter's education class, there's, there's, there's all these multiple steps that have to happen. So you got to be able to get there somehow. Yeah. 
Yeah, I always like to say there's there are like three spokes to our program, and it's kids, mentors, and land access. <laughs> the kids, we have plenty of those. We've we've found um, a good pool of kids to serve, right? With just the big brothers, big sisters, kids, um, shooting sports kids, and then you know hunter ed graduates. We love serving those kids. So we've been fortunate enough to have 20 years now, like I said, of networking with landowners. So we've got a ton of really generous landowners here in Kansas um, who welcome us out to help manage deer during the, you know, antlerless seasons or the pre-rut seasons. Uh, We've got lots of farmers out there with land saying, hey, I'll plant a sunflower field. If you guys can do a little work on it, you can hunt dove over it. Um, The same with waterfowl. Those types of situations, we've been really lucky. But we also like to take those those opportunities and um, tell those kids, you know, this is a very privileged (laughs) opportunity with this person. So in case you ever try to go out and hunt without us, here's how you find some other land. So that's where we like to introduce some weehaw hunting um, for folks who don't know. That's walk-in hunting areas, uh, public grounds, right? Uh, We like to utilize what they call here in Kansas special hunts. So it's kind of a lottery application where you can apply. And if you get selected, you typically get access to hunt properties in certain species that typically aren't open to the general public um, to go hunt publicly, which is a really cool opportunity. But we found here in Kansas, 20% of those go unfilled. So we've worked closely with our Department of Wildlife and Parks to fill those ones that don't get filled. So we get a lot of unique opportunity that way um, for land access. And, you know, Kansas is tough because we're 1% public land and that's a little sliver (laughs) of access that we can take advantage of. So we're we're constantly figuring out ways to get kids out more creatively and uh, like we talked earlier about preserves, that's one way we kind of resolved how do we find upland birds if we can't find upland birds. <laughs> and, um, so we're, we're constantly turning our, our wheels on finding land access and working with different people. Uh, we've been able to partner with uh, the Matador Cattle Company through Coke Industries and hunt their property. We get to hunt Ted Turner's property, um, Devlin Ranch here in town. We hunt at Flint Oak. Just a lot of really cool options because we are serving kids have opened up for us. That's a hell of a list of property. Yeah. (laughs) People get really excited about some of those too. (laughs) I can imagine. Um, Now you mentioned 1% public. Is that really truly the number? 1%. Yeah. I mean, they they tout the one point something or another million Weehaw properties. Yeah. Uh, you know, acres and Weehaw property, but. Yep. 1%. That's crazy. Yeah. Of, of the 50 states, we're, uh, we're definitely on the, the latter, latter end of uh, percentage of public lands. But, you know, they've, they've come up with things like that special hunt program to try to kind of ease the burden of not having access. And we've, we've really surveyed our kids who we have served um, historically. And if you ask them what are their top barriers, I mean, land access is usually in the top three. Um, not knowing where to go is also an issue. And then not having anyone to take them. And that, that's kind of a good segue into who we utilize as mentors. And the, for the short answer, it's anybody who's passionate about giving back. I think the hardest part about finding mentors is instilling the confidence in them that they can mentor somebody. I think so often we put this oh burden on us like, oh, I'm not educated enough in deer hunting to take a kid. I don't want to I don't want to ruin them. And I'm like, oh, we learn stuff every day in the field. So you're never going to be 100 percent ready to mentor a kid. But you have to start sometime. (laughs) And so we really like to lean on conservation groups of all of all areas, you know, pheasants, ducks, um, turkeys, RMEF, backcountry hunters and anglers. We really rely on all of those organizations to be our mentors. And then folks who aren't affiliated with organizations like that and just want to give back, we we don't turn them away by any means. Are you guys doing anything with uh, the uh, Veterans Initiative by uh, Backhunters Country, BHA? Uh, I, I don't think I know I'm you guys are kind of in the kids. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, I should connect you with the guy who's the national director. That'd be great. We, we do yeah, work with uh, the Fallen Outdoors quite a bit. 
Um, and I know they're a U.S. wide organization where they serve um, fallen vict or fallen uh, families of veterans and veterans too. I apologize. I we're we're gonna. I'm gonna have to put a little edit note in here. That's okay. Um, somebody's running some water upstairs and doesn't realize how bad it sounds down here. No, that's the microphone. okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, give me one second here. Okay, I can actually. No, can't do it from here. Okay, that's okay. I'll find it. We're about, about an hour in. One o three. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Anyways, so segueing into finding mentors um, and that challenge, how how much of your approach is just teaching them again that impact? Like you you told me mm -hmm. in the beginning, you know, the kid who didn't realize that there was other colors of cows mm -hmm. or other species, you know, subspecies and variations of of cows and in, in the color of them. Yeah. Um. Some of these very little experiences again that that person you know obviously takes for granted to a certain degree um does does just enlightening them on you know that specific story seem to help oh yeah i think too because we typically hang out with the people we normally hang out with right we quickly realize there are other people out there that aren't doing the same things as us and i think we kind of have shifted into a world of, you know, you kind of do you type of mentality and people don't realize what you get back personally when you do give to others, you know, the, the sacrifice you make giving up some of your own hunting time to take another kid hunting. I mean, I, I can't even put it into words how incredible it is. Um, you just have to try it. And like I mentioned, a lot of it's kind of just like, I like that. You just yeah, have to try it. I honestly, do. I, I, I can't say it any better. Like it, it, if you've never passed it on, like you guys reference, um, it, it, it almost becomes somewhat addictive. Yo, for sure. <laughs> People ask me every day, man, you have the best job in the world. I'm like, yeah, I do. You must go hunting every day. I'm like, not really. What? No, like I, I, I help get a lot of kids out hunting. And if I do go out, I typically take a kid with me and, I can guarantee you my I'm shaking and my heart's running just as hard as the kids is when a deer's out in front of them. Or I'm just as excited when they knock that pheasant, you know, out of the sky with that that shotgun they're shooting. And it's it's really cool to share that with a kiddo and you know, then to watch them share it with their family and, you know, get these responses back on how, you know, excited they are to share it with their classmates and things like that. It just it kind of just tickles you pink like, man. I didn't pull the trigger once today, but I felt like I did. <laughs> I oftentimes in the summer when we have even I get it on on small mouth, but not as much. Musky up here are kind of a, a a relatively rare catch. You know, they call it the fish of ten thousand casts or whatever. Mm. Um, there's some lore up here about it that makes it a little bit special as well, but um, I just, I'm always enamored by the fish. It's kind of, it, it's the pinnacle of, of, for me, predator fishing up here. Mm. And I get clients who catch these things. And oftentimes I'm just way over the top. And, yeah. um, I've had experiences where, you know, we have a contact with it, just a huge fish and don't hook up. And, you know, I, I'll shake for hour in the boat after something like that um and it's 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 a special really special moment when you you start to see somebody else develop the same kind of baseline and understanding for that critter that eventually leads to the same kind of passion that that you have for it like i, mm -hmm. I remember the first time i a couple of years ago when i had a guy out and and it was the first time i had kind of just taking somebody fishing that he actually, he was a vet. Um, yeah, we had contact with a, with a very large fish and I, about two hours it took us to get to the landing after that. And I shook the whole way and I 
still have been talking about it all the time it, to people during during the fishing season. It, it was an impactful moment in my life because he had a blast. Yeah, and he got he didn't even catch that fish. We didn't yeah. catch a muskie that day. Well, we did. He did. It was a little fish, but you know, I he couldn't go fishing. You know, he couldn't do this on his own anymore. And um, I, it, it was just an opportunity. And I rode the boat for eight hours of that day and cost me a little gas money and whatever. But I was on the river and I never picked up a rod. Yeah, that's and great. It's, uh, I don't know, it was kind of one, one of those moments where I was like, you know, this is actually a lot more fun than you would think it is. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I definitely... It was, it was the first time I was really taking somebody that I, I didn't know, knew there was going to be a substantial amount of work along with it. And I was definitely not super excited at the beginning of the morning when I knew what that was going on that day. Um, it felt like a responsibility more than, than going out fishing with some buddies for the day. And by the end of the day, I really kind of felt bad for even feeling that way in the morning because I had a lot of fun and almost mm-hmm. more fun than I would have had with, with a buck. Cause I got to meet somebody else. And I think there's, again, back to some of these very little impactful things that happen. Um, just meeting somebody new yeah, can change your life uh, you, in, in, in ways you wouldn't even know. So when you get to mix those things with also introducing them to something passionate or fun for you Mm -hmm. uh it's really a win-win yeah it quickly fills your cup that's for sure it does i know a couple people who 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 do specific mentoring and and he's very full (laughs) yeah Yeah, he just uh he takes on you know a couple people a year and just really dives in and and gives them a lot of opportunity yeah yeah i love that so kind of segue into what's your plans for 2020? Yeah. Two, it's a new year. Um, what kind of big things are you guys looking forward to this year? And, and then we'll kind of finish up with how people can uh, get in touch with you and anything you got going on that big hunts, maybe you uh, maybe haven't had on the horizon before yeah. that you're going to tackle this year yeah. <laughs> so yeah. let's talk about what we got going on this this fall yeah or, well i guess I kansas guess, isn't closed I, yet yeah i was gonna say we uh we're like we i get we class fire hunting seasons from like september one um to the end of may so yeah, we're like guys, mid-season right now um but yep, definitely especially for preserve and yes and, and controlled shooting areas, we're definitely yeah. like wrapping up a very busy um part of our season we just uh we're still in the middle of actually our extended antlerless deer season where um you can that tag, wraps up what this upcoming weekend maybe? Um, next weekend well different next, units so some yeah. wrap up this weekend and then there's a few others that are extended even another week which is just crazy wow. and awesome because we are taking advantage of it <laughs> absolutely um, we had just last weekend we had 35 different hunts across kansas um it was just wow. it was just awesome to see these kids uh, capitalizing on the outdoors and just some of the parents too. Their feedback was just incredible. It was really energizing and I was doing some uh, counting and some data work for our program and and we're we're definitely on like a fast track to um, plan three hundred hunts here in Kansas and in Iowa uh, this year <laughs> and that's that's pretty incredible because. For for reference, my first year starting this program and just me on the ground working, I was able to put together about 89 different hunts where we served about 220 kids. And I was like, yeah, that's great. Like, I feel good about that. And so we can grow this. Like, let's keep scaling in Kansas. So we hired on a um, part-timer turned full-timer and we planned 189 hunts and served about 500 kids. We're like, okay, this is good. This is really good. Let's let's try to hire another part timer on. And that's where we're at right now. Is is uh, we're we are on a very quick track to plan that many hunts. I think I just totaled up. We did 130 deer hunts this year. Um, and so all those other hunts are waterfowl, upland, um, predator, small game, dove, waterfowl. You name it. 
Um, and we're also, you know, kind of expanding there in Iowa. We were fortunate enough to partner with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and use some PR matching dollars uh, to get someone hired on part time. And that went so well. Our first few months of of work there, we were able to bring her on full time. So we've got a great gal there in Iowa um, putting in the work and getting a lot of kids out there, too. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's been a really good season. It's almost hard to keep up with all of the the pictures and the stories. I mean, I could spend a whole week after a weekend of hunting just following up with people and like, tell me all about it. <laughs> and sometimes I do. I mean, it's just that enjoyable to get such great response from so many people. Do you typically, when you take the kids out, is there typically a parent involved? Yep. So, and do you see retention from from the parent? Yeah, isn't that uh, great? Into the sport, maybe that wouldn't have been introduced other yeah. than through the child. Yeah. Let's talk R three for a minute, right? So, recruitment, retention, and reactivation is is really important in the outdoors. And when we first started this program, our intention was how do we retain these kids and recruit these kids? Because at first, we didn't quite know if the population of these kids were hunting a lot. We assumed they weren't, which we were actually very wrong. So if you look at our data, about 80% of the kids we serve have gone hunting before. So when you asked, have you gone hunting before, 80% say yes. We're like, whoa. And a lot of people look at that number and say, well, there's no reason for a program like yours. Why would you waste your time and energy and money? So we dug a little deeper. (laughs) And when we survey these kids a little farther, we ask them, how many years have they been hunting? And over 60% of them are less than three years, okay? So we ask them again, how many times a year do you go hunting? And over 60% of them say less than three times a year. Now, if I was a betting woman, I would say those kids who are going out and hunting fewer than three times a year probably aren't going to keep hunting. And I will use some examples. So say these kids go to college, right? They can't take their firearms to their dorm room. They are typically probably up, uprooting their life in their hometown and moving to a new town so they don't know where to go. <laughs> and then they graduate and start into the corporate world like most of us do. And there's just not a lot of time, right? So that's where we kind of established our importance of retention of these kids. So if they are dabbling in the sport, how do we keep them here? And a lot of that is social support, right? And gosh, social media drives that. <laughs> These trap teams, the camaraderie on the teams drive that. So what we really like to do and to cover both the parents and their friends, we like to organize these hunting opportunities where kids can go out in groups. So get two or three of your teammates, sign up for this hunt and go. It's awesome because now these kids know, oh, we can shoot trap together and we can go shoot dove together. That's neat. Now, on the parent side of things, because we are extra cautious of just the safety of all of our parties, we all know deer hunting, um, turkey hunting can be a pretty close quartered situation. Um, We we require all of our kids to have a parent go with them no matter what. And that's really interesting sometimes because a lot of our parents don't hunt. However, with that being said, when you get a parent in the blind and they get to watch their kid shoot a deer for the first time, I mean, it's like Christmas Day times 100. (laughs) The excitement and like the storytelling and just the overall experience that they get, they have with that is enough for them to be like, well, maybe I'll consider hunting. Maybe I should get my license. Maybe I should look at doing this. And now they're even more bought in to get their kid outdoors because a lot of times these kids don't have cars to transport themselves or the, the money to buy a license. So we're really, we're really hitting all three R's um, with this program. And gosh, if we had, of course, if we had more time, more money, more help, we could totally start another program just for the parents in our, in our program. Because I do think a lot of them will start hunting because of our program or they will dust off their shotgun like they used to hunt um, and get back out there. That's really fantastic. Yeah. I, I mean, that's where we're going to see more conservationists, more people caring about places and hopefully more land access Mm -hmm. long-term as we grow, because I mean, that's the big paradox. That's the problem. 
as more people go, we, we have to have more funds to be able to acquire more land and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. So it's, it's a big, big circle that has to be fulfilled. And yeah. if you don't have enough people in the funnel, you know, it dries up. Yeah. And if you don't feel supported in the outdoor world, you're not going to keep doing that either. And that's kind of the importance we found with really cultivating a good environment of, you know, either teammates or other kids who are doing similar activities that some of these kids are already doing, you know, getting their parents involved. And man, I tell these conservation group mentors all the time, I'm like, this is the future of your chapter. This is the future of hunting and in our state, in our world. And man, it's necessary that they know your mission and your intention and, and you get to guide them in that process. And that's, that's so rich. I cannot tell you more. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's the reason I'm a guide. Yeah. Um, I, there's some occasions where I feel almost bad taking money. Right. Um, because I get to see it happen and I get a lot of enjoyment out of it personally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how can, you know, you mentioned it all oh, having more time, having more help and, yeah, right? and more funds, <laughs> um, being a nonprofit, you guys definitely can take donations. Um, it, do yeah. you see, um, personal donations as a, as a large funding mechanism to your organization and in your future? Yeah. So we, we have different, um, fundraising avenues we pursue and as all nonprofits do, right? So we write grants of various capacities. Um, we also run raffles and fundraisers that people can partake in, which is kind of fun because then you get a chance to win something back with your donation. Or we have a lot of folks who just make outright donations just because they heard about us or maybe their kiddo had a good experience with us. Um, all of those donations, th that generosity we're so thankful for because without our donors, we, we would be in trouble. We wouldn't be able to put as many boots on the ground as we have right now um, to serve more kids. So if, yeah, if anybody wants to donate, we've got lots of options. We do different raffles for, you know, Kansas deer raffles or an Alaskan fishing trip. Um, we kind of trick out some different uh, firearms and raffle them off. That's kind of fun. Uh, we have multiple fundraisers, golf tournaments, clay shoots, concerts, you name it. We're, we're all about pursuing those options. So definitely check out our website um, and you can see all of those options under, under the donate tab. Right on. I will definitely include a specific tab for, for that. Oh, thank so you. people can get, click on that in the show notes. And then I'll also include, do you, do you guys have a prevalent prevalence on social media that, uh, yeah, yeah. I can include some information there too. Yeah. You guys can all find us on Facebook and Instagram, which we use pretty, pretty aggressively. And you can find us as outdoor mentors on both of those. Well, right on what, um, Lastly, what do you got going on? And then I don't know that you, you let us, uh, you had 300 some hunts this, yeah. this past season. Uh, you know, what, what are you guys pushing for, for 2022? Right. That's a good question. You know, we're, we're really hopeful to expand in some other states. So, um, stay tuned. Cause I think we've got a few states in mind and we're kind of in the works on some things. So, I mean, I imagine if we can get expanded into another state, keep growing in Iowa, keep growing in Kansas, I'm sure we can plan upwards of 450, uh, 500 hunts without a problem. Remind me I said that next year. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll definitely have to stay in touch and have to get you back on. Yeah. And, and yeah. So hopefully you can boast about even more hunts than that. Yeah. And I would like to put a plug in here too. If anybody is interested in, in not donating financially, but their time as a mentor, or maybe they have some land they're looking to uh, serve better, you know, give us a shout because we love working with people with where they're at, you know. Um, a lot of our landowners, we have very temporary access, you know, they've got things leased out or stuff's going on to where we can only hunt a certain season, which is great. We love that. We've got some mentors who only want to hunt certain, certain species with us. We love that too. So, um, I got the gift of gab. I love talking to our mentors and getting to know them more. And I'm happy to have those conversations with some folks. Well, I definitely think there's some room to expand up here and I, Definitely have some land access and uh, um, 
some things to talk to you about in the future here. Awesome. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm glad you came on the podcast here. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. This is great. Absolutely. And, you know, people have hung in this long for the show. <laughs> um, you know, you might as well plug your own podcast because I think exactly. you got something that you're uh, at least uh, dabbling behind the microphone as well. Yeah. We thought, well, here's COVID and who knows when we're getting out of this. Why not try our hand at a podcast? So my, uh, my co-host and I, uh, Rob McDonald, um, started a, a podcast called the Great Plains Outdoors podcast. Um, you can give us a Google search and we're on Facebook and Instagram and on Podbean and um, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts, all those avenues. But uh, we're yeah, we're just getting started with it. Um, I talked to Brian a little bit about our podcast and uh, we're definitely green, but we're just a bunch of mom and pop folks sitting around as I describe it, just uh, shooting the breeze and having fun talking about the outdoors and different opportunities out there. Well, if, if people like my podcast, then, you know, they'll definitely like yours too. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's about what mine is. Yeah, I love you it. Know, uh, pretty uh, raw and uh, I, you know, have, have, I like to try to teach and, and as well as, as, as give some value and, and connect people. You know, your organization um, is, is in Kansas and Iowa and looking to grow and, I've got listeners all over the country, actually all over the world, mm-hmm. um, or at least they, it says they got downloads in every continent. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, uh, regardless, you know, the, the outreach and, and the things that are potential here, both with different podcasts and, and organizations like yourself are, are, are great. And I love just kind of exposing that. So I, I again, thank you so much for coming on the show and yeah, um, thank you, Brian. I, I, I appreciate it. Happy hunting you guys uh, next week here in Kansas. Yes, I'm I'm crossing my fingers that 2022 is going to start with 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 a successful um, pickup of my pickup <laughs> and no vehicle <laughs> issues throughout a nice long hunting trip where I get to have my dogs and my dog box and there all these nice go. things that I I've, I've been. Um, more or less challenged to have last year. Yeah. <laughs> I I had a 2020 or 2018 Silverado and I had it for two years and I had a bunch of problems with it in the last year. And then I bought a pickup and four hours into the last Kansas trip, uh, had pickup problems. Mm. So, <laughs> uh, oh, it's 2022. It's a brand new year. It so new it, year, I think you uh, spoke it into existence. You're going to, it's going to be great. Exactly. So I, I appreciate you casting a little bit of good luck my yes. way. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. All the good luck. Well, well, we'll stay in touch here and I will include all your, your information in the show notes so people can reach out and I, I wish the best. Yeah. You too, Brian. Thank you. that's a wrap on another show thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the amazing outdoors podcast like share subscribe and most of all leave a comment i guess i really appreciate interacting with you folks you all know how to get a hold of me but in case you don't know you can hit me up at brian at amazing.com most of all I hope everybody had a great hunting season, has plans. If they haven't quite wrapped it up yet, there's a few states that might still have some quarry out there. Enjoy the time you get out in the outdoors. Bring somebody along. Most of all, I guess, join the conservation groups. It's really important that uh, we have them. There's some things going on with predator hunting out west, and it's these conservation groups that are going to help you fight your right to to pursue these animals and, and have the spaces to do so so check out patreon i'm about to launch this thing and right now i think you can join for five bucks um 
going to have a lot more ways to interact with you listeners and some some giveaways coming hopefully have some hats and t-shirts and a few other things and a few things from the sponsors as well so happy new year all hope you're off to a rocking good show good start and uh, shoot straight and we'll see you out in the woods god bless america god bless all you <laughs>